We're in the Herbert Lehman Suite at Columbia University, where we're speaking with Professor Thavolia Glimpf, Professor of History at Duke University. Uh, Professor Glimpf is an expert on 19th century women's history, and particularly the history of enslaved and not enslaved women. Let's turn then to the piece of your work, and we'll plunge right into the piece of your work that I think makes us all smarter. And that is the conception that you have of the plantation household as not so much a private, intimate space, but a workspace. And the notion that you have that when we actually look at the plantation household as a workspace, we see it entirely differently. Can you talk about that a little bit? I think it's really important to see this space, um, this home, um, as a space of work. And I think the plantation house is different from um, the home of an urbane New Yorker in 1850 or 1860 for many reasons. Um, and I think it's not a private home and it's made not private by virtue of the fact that it puts to work these enslaved people within the space. Now one could argue, well, what difference does that make? They're just working in the house. But it turned it into a public space in many respects. The, the main difference, and I think what we tend to think about when we say, no, it's not a public space, is that these people, um, that is the enslaved people, are not getting paid. And so they're like part of the family. And, and it goes back to what, um, uh, how Southerners, plantation owners, uh, spoke of slaves as part of the family. It's my mm -hmm. family, black and white. And if you have this idea of my family, black and white, it certainly appeals to a sense of, of privacy and the home as a private space. And yet the mistress of that home didn't treat enslaved workers in the as home. They, as if they were family. As if they were family. No, she treated them as if they were slaves, which they were, and as if she were their owner, which she was, which meant that she had to manage them. And so we, there's some confusion then when we get to the Civil War, and just to jump ahead a bit, because um, historians uh, for a long time began with the assumption, well, war comes and these women have no experience in how to manage slaves, but that's just not true. They have plenty of experience, um, although war does make a difference. But they have to manage the women, and their husbands give them full reign to manage and punish. Um, and so these households become spaces of work and spaces of the kind of violence that slavery entails, because you can't enslave people and keep them working without either using violence or threatening to use it, right? And so you don't have to beat them every day, but they have to know that you can. And so when a slaveholding woman sits in her chair to knit and she keeps a whip by her side and you walk by and you've done nothing to irk her, but she takes up the whip and she whips you. Mm. That's an exercise of power. Mm. and. And it just takes recognition of that fact. Um, one could um, try to understand her position from a position of powerlessness in, in, in relationship to her husband or her father or patriarchy in general. Slaveholding women, no less than slaveholding men, and this may be not the the right word, but they enjoyed the possession of power that slaveholding gave them. And by enjoyed, I'm not speaking of kind of an emotional, um, in an emotional way, but enjoyed the benefits of it. I don't think that slaveholding men were necessarily in, inherently cruel people, but slavery required that they be and no less for the women that they married or, or who, um, who were their daughters. Slavery cannot exist without violence or the threat of violence. Mm. And if you're going to manage slaves, because as you pointed out, they can't, 
you can't fire them and they can't resist except by running away or refusing to do what you ask them to do in the way you want it done. So an enslaved woman would say, you want me to dust the entire house? Fine. And she might dust a little bit of it. And you come mm -hmm. along, you say, well, you know, you didn't finish the job. And you keep asking her to do this job, and she never does it right. And so what do you do? You do it your damn self mm -hmm. and to teach her a lesson. But you haven't taught her anything. Rather, she thinks she's taught you something, something. that you're going to do some work here. Um, as well. And so then you as a slave, not you personally, of course, but you as a slave mistress or, or mistress of a plantation, you begin to form a view that's um, part and parcel of a larger ideology, right? That these women who work for you are lazy. They cannot um, understand and follow through on simple orders that you give them. They deserve to be enslaved. Mm -hmm. And they, on the other hand, think, well, we taught her something. And the more we do this, the more she's going to have to do. Now, it's not going to make her the worker in the home, but it's going to lessen what I do. And if, you, if a mistress says, well, you have to stay in the house 24 hours, except for whatever errands I send you on, and it's, for me, it's just human things. I, and I say this in my work. If I'm a young woman and I'm enslaved and there's a young man on the plantation that I'm falling in love with, and the only way I can get to see him is to crawl out of a window secretly at night, that's not right, right? And so as a young woman, I'd be inclined to try to find some way to make your life difficult and also to keep resisting in whatever way I can to see this young man that I've fallen in love with. And slavery doesn't permit love in that way to blossom. It, it, it fights against it. It happens, but it fights mm. against it.